Everyone, good afternoon. Welcome. It's a pleasure to have you to our second session on the civic empowerment gap. Uh, my name is Rick Weisbord. I'm uh, on the faculty here at the Grad School of Education at the Kennedy School of Government, and I'm the faculty director of the Making Caring Common Project, which um, is sponsoring this initiative and which seeks to put caring and justice at the center of child raising and at the center of our families in our society. Um, I want to just start by giving a quick shout out to all the young people in this program and all the young people out there who are working on voting and voting rights and voter mobilization and working to strengthen our brave and beautiful experiment in democracy. And I also just wanted to quickly remember John Lewis today, whose service was today, and I really hope that you get a chance to listen to some of the absolutely beautiful eulogies, including Barack Obama's beautiful eulogy, but many more. Um, but a person of tremendous moral clarity and courage, and also one of the great advocates for voting rights and democracy of all time. So um, I wanted just to remember him. Here is the plan for today. Uh, I'm gonna turn this over in just a minute to, um, to Rune and to Hannah Neal, who I will introduce in a minute, who um, are gonna, I'm sorry, it's not who I'm turning it over for. I'm gonna, we're going to first hear from our speakers. So we will, I will first hear from Mir Mira Levinson. Um, maybe we, will, we will then hear from Shad Floyd. Then I will turn this over to Tarun um, and to Hannah Neal, who will interview um, Sean, engage in conversation, and interview Mira and Shaw. Um, Mira and Sean will speak for about 10 to 15 minutes. Between them, Tarun and Hannah Neal will interview them for 10 to 15 minutes, and then we will have 10 to 15 minutes for Q&A. So please um, put your questions um, uh, in the Q&A box and we will have time for at least some of your questions. Um, let me introduce my terrific colleague, Mira Levinson. Um, Mira's work, uh, Mira's a former teacher. She was a teacher in a couple school systems within the Boston Public Schools for many years. Um, she's now been at the Ed School for, I don't know, 10 or 15 years, quite a long time, but she does work on civic empowerment, on civic education. Um, she's one of my really treasured colleagues and um, very interested in strengthening democracy and strengthening um, the voice of underrepresented groups in this country. So it's a real pleasure to have her. Sean Floyd is a, somebody I've just met recently, but Sean has a long history um, of organizing, of or organizing young people, of organizing in the black and brown community, and also teaches at George Washington, and it's a real pleasure to have him here. Taruna Massa is one of the members, uh, terrific members of our advisory board, um, the Making Caring Common Youth Advisory Board. And he is from Boulder, Colorado, and he has, is entering college um, this year. And ha Hannah Neal Morinville is from Overland, Kansas. She's a rising senior in high school. And it's great to have both of them here doing these interviews. So let me um, turn this over to you, Mira, and if you could launch us, that would be great. Terrific. Uh, thanks so much, uh, Rick, uh, for setting this up and for the introduction and to uh, Sean for uh, co-presenting with me and to Tarun and Hannah Neal for then uh, leading our conversation. Um, I'm actually going to ask, because John Lewis's work uh, and life, um, I don't know, it, it, it is, it embodies everything that we're going to be talking about today and everything that he worked for. Um, uh, I, I'm going to ask us to take a moment of silence, but actually I'm going to ask us to do it in about five minutes. Um, because uh, what I want to do is uh, kind of do a little bit uh, to uh, set up um, why his work is unfinished and um, what his work uh, has gotten us and, and where we need to go. So. As Rick said, um, I teach at the Harvard Graduate School of Education. I've done a fair amount of work in civic education. I used to actually be a middle school teacher uh, in the Atlanta and the Boston Public Schools. And um, one of the things that I have always been passionate about, no matter what level of education I've been involved in, 
is um, helping my students uh, sort of empower themselves, right? Like I would, I would say empowering kids, my students, but that imp implies that, right, uh, that students are the objects of others' empowerment, right? And a lot of, especially those of you who are actually on this webinar uh, are here because you are interested in actually uh, gaining and exercising power yourselves and helping your peers do so. Um, and I think that oftentimes in the United States, we have a, uh, I mean, not I think, it's quite clear, we have a language around individual empowerment. And we have this idea, right, of pulling yourself up from, by your own bootstraps, of what it means uh, to succeed as an individual. And um, that is a very powerful narrative in the United States. And it's also a strongly misleading narrative in the United States. Um, uh, you know, as President Obama said fairly famously uh, a few years ago, you didn't build that on your own. None of us has built ourselves up on our own. Uh, and we can only build ourselves up uh, as individuals and build our community and our nation up if we do it together. Um, however, some of us have way, way, way more power when we do the exact same things. <laughs> as others of us have, right? And so that's the concept that I wanna start with, which is uh, what I call the civic empowerment gap. Um, so uh, some of you may have heard of say the academic achievement gap, which I think is a slight misnomer because it sounds as if one group sort of has the uh, norm of achievement, uh, of achievement to which others ought to aspire, but right, but that's an idea that say, uh, depending on your race, your ethnicity, uh, to some extent, your gender, your uh, home language, et cetera, it's fairly predictable uh, whether or not you will be at the higher or lower end of academic achievement statistically, right? Um, and that, and we've taken on board the idea that schools are really responsible for shrinking and narrowing that academic achievement gap. And that that's, there's nothing about the bodies of poor kids or black and brown kids um, or kids who speak Spanish at home or Amharic or whatever, right? That, that makes them less able to be academically achieving. But what we've done is we've structured society, right? In order to make it harder for some kids to uh, realize their natural talents um, and to demonstrate those and to develop as well as others. We have done that equally in this society with respect to citizenship, right? Um, so the civic empowerment gap refers to the idea that we can predict based on your demographics, how much civic and political power you have. That in itself, like should draw us all up short, right? Because that is fundamentally anti-democratic and illegitimate, right? The idea of a democracy is fundamentally opposed to the idea that an individual's personal characteristics should have anything to do with how much civic and political power you have, right? But that is true in the United States, right? Uh, so it's true that say I, as a, a middle-class um, you know, white woman with uh, graduate degrees, if I go testify in front of the city council I will be accorded more respect and be listened to more than, frankly, if Sean goes and testifies. And Sean will be listened to more, on average, right, than if Hannah Neal goes and testifies, right? There are privileges based on age, privileges based on class, privileges based on race and ethnicity, privilege, right? All sorts of privileges that we are offered for no good reason other than, say, you know, the legacies of and the ongoing existence of white supremacy, of classism, of racism, of xenophobia, uh, et cetera, ageism, right? Um, unfortunately, not only do we face differences in how much power we have, though, when we engage in the same behaviors, but also for a whole variety of reasons, what behaviors groups engage in also diverges. So as a white a person with a graduate degree, you can predict if you look at census data that I am extremely likely to vote. And that's true, I do. I vote in every single election, right? I, I've already sent off my stuff so that I can vote by mail in both my primary and, uh, and the general election uh, this fall, right? Uh, about 80% of people who fit my demographic vote. 
On the other hand, uh, people who have less than a high school education, who earn under $15,000 a year, uh, and who are non-white, somebody in that category statistically is less than 30% likely to have voted in the last election. So when you compound those numbers, right, not only do I have more power when I do the exact same thing as, any, as some of the rest of you do, right, but also people from my various demographic groups, if you cluster us, we do some things that actually give us power at higher rates than other people. Uh, than group other groups do. Now that's no accident. And that's not because say I'm a member of a particularly virtu virtuous group and say somebody who did not graduate from high school and who earns a low income is a, is a member of like a civic slacker group, right? That's not how it works. The way that I have been inducted into my civic participation, including voting, is I get phone calls, right, from political parties really, really, really frequently, right, <laughs> you know, very annoyingly frequently. But that's because they know how much my house costs, they know that I'm a homeowner, right, they can tell, like, there's all sorts of demographic information out there about me, they know that I have voted in previous elections, they know that I have donated to candidates, so I am a really good target for their work. On the other hand, if there is somebody who's living in a, a rental property, who does not have the same credit history as I do, who has not donated to candidates, who does not have the same record of voting, maybe they are tr transient, maybe they moved, right? They've moved from city to city, right? So you can't tell even if they did vote in every previous place, right? They have no record of voting here. They're not going to get contacted in the same way, right? And the evidence shows that the strongest predictor for taking civic action, for getting involved, including for voting, is to be invited by somebody you know to take that action. I am surrounded by people who invite me into the civic and political space. Many other people are not surrounded by those people, and in fact, they're neglected entirely, right? So part of our work, I think, in the United States is to expand our circles of uh, community, and of invitation so that more people are invited into the civic space and so that we work as allies together to empower us collectively and not only particular groups. And then the last thing I wanna say before then I move us into John Lewis is that what happens when these things um, add up is that you have some people whose interests are very well represented and other people who, no matter how hard you try, right, you may feel as if your interests are not being represented at all. So there was a lot of cheering in 2018 after the midterm elections that voter turnout jumped enormously. So among 18 to 29 year olds in 2018, voter turnout went from 20% in 2014 to 36% in 2018. Huge jump, 79% jump. That is great, except that means that two thirds of eligible voters who were under 30 years old did not vote in 2018, okay? If you look at the midterm voter uh, patterns by say race, about 58% of non-Hispanic whites voted in the midterm. That's amazing. You never get voting rates like that in the midterm. However, 40% of Asians and 40% of Hispanic citizens voted in the midterm, right? That's a difference that matters. It matters with respect to who interests get represented, to whose power, uh, who has power. And again, I said like that, you know, about 36% of 18 to 29 year olds voted, 66% of 65 year olds and over voted. So if you think about who is going to ex have the power to determine what our policies are, those patterns matter. Again, I'm not saying that it's individuals who bear the responsibility, but it is something that we need to engage in collective work so that we change these patterns and eliminate the civic empowerment gap and get us back to the kind of democracy 
uh, that John Lewis has, you know, got into good trouble for, for, um, uh, you know, years, for eight decades of his life. So with that, before I pass it over to Sean, I'm just going to ask if we can take 30 seconds, because I know I went too long as well, um, to honor John Lewis for his work and trying to uh, spread voting rights to everybody. And then Sean, I'll just let you take us out of it. Good afternoon, everyone. Mira, again, thank you for that wonderful moment of silence in honor of the great Congressman John Lewis. Um, it's funny that you brought this up. I mean, and of course, everybody's talking about it, but I had had a whole different topic of conversation for today. And then after watching the funeral, um, listening to more and more people talk, learning a little bit more about his history, my history, um, and quite frankly, the history of America as a whole, um, it kind of shifted some of the talking points that I wanted to make today. Um, I think that you hit everything on the head. I think that one of the things that you and I had a discussion about earlier this week was the level of influence and trust within minority communities and how that is used to engage civically. Um, and, and I think that we also looked at the fact of where those informational resources come from, um, what our opportunities are based on as some of the things you pointed out, like economic status, um, location, environment, whether you're in rural community or even in an urban community, um, and quite frankly, what those state laws within, within the states that you're living in, the municipal municipalities actually allow you to do. Um, I've been on the ground for quite a while now. I've done a number of different races um, over the last 10 years. Um, but more recently, I just spent the last six months helping to train field organizers um, for the presidential. And one of the things that we looked at uh, when we were in the state of Arizona, who has some very unique uh, voting right laws um, and, and cultural things going on there. Um, but we went out to go do what we identify as, you know, our traditional canvassing, to your point, Mira, about those targets of income and education level, um, sex, quite honestly, your race uh, profile, those types of things. And what we decided to do was target some of the communities that typically don't get to hear um, from us as quote unquote campaign staffers, right? So we went into a, a very uh, familiar Latino community that was in the radius of where we were starting at. And one of the challenges that we realized we were getting when we started to knock on doors was that either A, people would not answer the doors, uh, B, if they did answer the door, they would misidentify themselves. So we may have their right name and information um, and want to talk to them as a voter or a potential voter, uh, but because of Arizona's laws, especially around immigration, they became a lot more apprehensive uh, to that level of engagement and interaction. Uh, one of the other things that we realized is, is something as simple as where we thought we were identifying ourselves and that would help us. There was actually a level of fear um, and pushback, if you will, by our name badges with our organization and who we were and what it was we were trying to do. So it became even a, a different level of challenge for us to get that particular community engaged in the process, even though we were purposely driven to target individuals who typically are not involved in that everyday process. Um, don't receive that same level of communication to your point. Uh, I have a number of friends uh, that are minorities across the board and we get together all the time and say, how come none of our phones have ever rang when it came time to be polled uh, by a presidential candidate um, or a gubernatorial candidate or those things? And to your point, even Mira, sometimes even when we do make that money and are in those same economic classes. Um, I think that it is also interesting that when students tend to get involved um, in the process, their experiences are different across the board as well, regardless of their educational level. Uh, so because of the fact that, like myself, similar to John Lewis, I am a first generation college graduate on both sides of my family, um, and even going out and participating in politics, sometimes you can get the impression that you are the token for that political candidate within that community, um, which can either be positive or negative in some ways, depending, depending upon how you as an individual decide to process that, right? For me personally, I've chosen to take it as, okay, well, if I got to be the person that's going to be 
your quote unquote African American um, or your minority involved in your team, then what is it that I can do as that minority for my community to empower more of us to become involved, to get engaged? Is there a door I can open? Are there five friends I can bring with me to your point to help shift and shape this, shape this? Because as we talk about too, again, we want to see change. And when we're not as active as we need to be, and sometimes don't even know how to be active, it is harder for us to achieve that change that we are trying to see in a simple form of equity, right? Um, so I, I think that it, it is very important now, uh, more than ever, as we see the movements going on, that we start to use what I like to look at as a, a library comparison, right? Our inside and our outside voices, right? There are people who are going to be on the ground, they're going to march, they're going to show up, they're going to hold signs, and they're going to protest and do everything out there. And then there are other people who need to be on that inside in that quieter space, understanding how the mechanics work, so we can also shift that policy um, and our positions and stance from the inside as well to help complement what is happening happening on the outside. So I'll stop there uh, because I think that we're, we're running a little close in the time. Um, but overall, like this is what's happening on the ground. We have to find a way to establish that trust, to establish that level of influence um, and be culturally sensitive and aware of the communities that we're targeting to actually do this. Rick, you're muted. Go. Um, terrific, thank you. Um, Hannah Neal or Tarun, I'm hand it off to you. Hi, right, Mr. Floyd. Hi, Ms. Levinson. Thank you so much for speaking to us today. Really appreciate it. How's your Not summer been so far? Fantastic. So far, stuck in COVID, but you know, I'm making yeah, it. Work. For sure. Is it hot near where you both are, or is it kind of humid? How's the temperature? DC is set on 3,000 right now. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> and then I'm assuming you're in Boston, Miss Levinson? Yeah, yeah. Please call me Mira. Oh, uh, un unless that makes you uncomfortable. You're welcome. To, I mean, if it makes you uncomfortable. You no, know, it's always a funny thing, thing for me because Mira. sometimes like an adult tells you and then you're like, do I do it? Do I not? So do I'll, go with, <laughs> yeah. I'll go with Miss Levinson Mira. for now. Or Mira. Okay. <laughs> okay, there we go. There we go. Yeah, yeah okay, you can so. think Mira, Mira on the wall. That's a good number. That's a good one. See, <laughs> my name is pronounced hard to, it's Tarun, so I tell myself Maroon. So, you know, we already have talking to people and trying to get our names right. So there we go. Exactly. So just wanted to kick it off with a quick question. So I, Mr. Or Professor Weisport just mentioned that both of you were in teaching capacities, either as lecturers and professors, correct? Is that... Mm -hmm. yes. Correct. Mm -hmm. yes. Awesome. So I guess one question I want to ask, especially around civic engagement, surrounds like the role of both teachers, both as a mentor and someone to educate. So the thought I had, like when you mentioned like the face value, like what a specific voter has, right? What type of impact that individual has. I feel like there are also factors that might impact that, right? Like there are studies that show like if you vote as a good youth, for example, then that increases how many times you show up at the voting poll. And then you mentioned mm -hmm. if someone invites you to a poll, that increases like the chance that you end up doing that. So I guess the question I want to ask are like, what are some ways that a teacher could work to motivate students either through an educational lens or through like a fun lens, whether that be like a pizza party or something like that? What do you think are the best ways to motivate youth to look at their vote like it matters and look at it like some type of challenge that they need to go head forth and make a difference in yeah, maybe I'll start with that. Um, so I think that it's actually, so there are tons of things that teachers can do. But one of the things I want to clarify is that fascinatingly, for most of us, it's not like we got involved as voters or in politics or in civic life because we were initially motivated. For some of us, that's true. For some of us, like we're five and we're totally passionate about an issue and we like try to figure out how to get involved. For many of us though, what happens is that we're kind of dragged into it or we end up in there accidentally, right? Like we're pulled by our mom or an aunt or a, whatever, a grandfather in, you know, to go to a meeting to these days to participate in a march or a protest or whatever, right? Um, or a friend says, oh, there's free pizza down at, you know, the youth center, come with me and you can grab a slice. I think we're like licking envelopes, but it doesn't matter. Like we can just, you know, hang and chat and lick some envelopes. Like, that's the way that a lot of this happens. Um, and it is from the behavior of doing these things that then eventually we develop the identity 
oh, I am, I have the identity, I am a voter, right? I am an involved citizen. Not because we started out with the motivation, but because we started out with the behavior. So what does that mean for teachers? Well, one thing that teachers have a ton of control over is what students do, right? You know, and so teachers can be those personal contacts who bring students into civic life and civic behaviors, right? Uh, you know, yes, there's voting and there's also getting informed and there's protesting and there's testifying and there's being part of solidaristic movements um, and there's volunteering. Uh, like there's so many things, you know, there's problem solving, right? There's being part of the democratic deliberations. There's so many things that young people can do um, in classrooms, in their schools, out of classrooms, right? Whether that's student government or a debate or in extracurriculars where they're in charge rather than teachers being in charge. And then outside of schools, right? But also where the school is supporting them in doing that. And, you know, initially you may do it because it's an assignment or because your best friend signed up for it. So you think, well, I don't have anything better to do. Like I, for my book, No Sis and Left Behind, I interviewed a bunch of young people who had beaten the civic empowerment gap in 24 out of the 25 cases, their account to me of why that happened was because there was somebody specific who invited them to participate. A pastor, a teacher, a parent, a friend, bunch of people, like there was one really memorable story of a young woman who was actually on her school committee. She was like on the school board, basically, as the youth rep. She had started out being involved because she had wanted to go do the dance team and the dance team was full, but this like youth organizing thing uh, was open and it paid. And she was like, all right, I'll earn eight bucks an hour. <laughs> um, like that's how these things happen. It doesn't have to be about like tapping into motivation. It's about tapping into action and then seeing that the action pays off. I can agree with that. Sean, do you want to jump in on this one quickly? And then I want to turn to him and Neil. Sorry. Absolutely. I would say really quickly, I think that the word activism has become so big, right? And I think because it's so big, people only associate it with one form of being active. And that's usually some either crazy protest where everybody has to be marching in one space, or if there's a massive letter writing campaign, everybody has to write the same letter or sign their name on a template. And I think that becomes part of what limited is that engagement a little bit. I think that as teachers to your to the point of your question, the level of encouragement and how we help people understand what it means to be active um, can go a long way. Um, I, I think that, again, I think there's something wrong with everything that we're doing in this country on a number of different levels. But what is it that matters to you most? And it may not be government and politics, right? You could be an athlete um, and want to be a football player and go, hey, well, what's going on with the concussion situation and, and, and equipment safety um, and playing on the fields, right? You can become active in that way. If it is trash in your community um, and, you know, you want to get together with a group of folks in a doctor room, right? You're coming together, you're forming that coalition and, and, and again, becoming active that way. It could be that you are working two jobs and don't really have time, but the one thing you can do is sign your name to that letter that's going out to the masses, and that is also your form of being active, right? So I think that finding some way to, to connect to some level of activism is the gateway to becoming involved into more around building that community and, and what we're actually doing. Ken and Neil, we'd lo love to hear a question from you. I just also want to encourage the participants, people who are listening to, uh, we've got a great question from Jay Philbrick, but to um, put their questions in the Q&A. Yeah, so the question that I actually have is, goes along with what both Ms. Levinson and Mr. Ford have spoken about. So Ms. Levinson, you said in particular that no matter how hard you try, um, you're still not going to be represented. And Mr. Floyd, you said that even when you do target minorities, um, either um, there's apathy shown sometimes or there's apprehensiveness. So my question is, um, when we do elect, uh, elect politicians, what steps can underrepresented communities take to keep politicians and hold them accountable for the goals and the promises that they're making towards underrepresented communities or minorities? 
Sean, do you want to take it first this time and then I'll go? Sure, I can jump in. Um, the first thing I would say is really understand that your vote counts, right? I think that is one of the things that is, is, is used to leverage voter suppression, that it's crazy, right? People go out, they vote, sometimes their candidate doesn't win, and as a result, they go, oh, my candidate never wins. Every time I do this, my vote doesn't count, and then they go off um, into their own little zone and, and are no longer as active in that process, right? I think that one, ensuring that not just you vote, but you're taking people to vote with you. Um, it is very important, especially in this environment of COVID, right? There are so many people who are getting mail-in mail ballots um, that either A, don't know they're coming, or B, haven't checked their mailbox in two weeks and didn't realize it was there, so they approached that deadline, um, but there are a number of things there. I think the second thing is don't be afraid to organize, right? Get with folks who have like-minded issues and concerns within the community or what's going on with your elected officials and actually make those appointments. Schedule that time to go sit in their office if you can and if you can afford that. If you can't, then figure out what your best process may be. It could very well be a writer letting campaign, right? It could be showing up on a Saturday to an event where you know the candidate's going to be at and requesting that time in person because that's what's convenient for you. One thing I will say is I think anybody that's been really successful in, 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 in civic engagement have really found a way to just use whatever opportunity was presented to them at that time. It may not always be perfect. I don't think that there ever is a perfect time to address some of the things that we're trying to deal with, but we have to start somewhere and taking that first step and keeping those relationships and building upon those relationships um, can definitely start helping you hold your elected officials accountable. Great. What I would, uh, I think everything Sean said is exactly right. And I would add a couple of things. One is go local, right? So the data that I was giving was for uh, national elections where, you know, it's the, it's not the whole nation because it's the 50 states and this electoral college, et cetera. Right. But like, we're talking, I mean, like, that's a big honking election where um, the numbers, you know, play out differently in local elections is really, really rare for more than 30, 40% of a population to vote. If you can organize people in your neighborhood or in your school or in your demographic to go out, you can actually change things a lot and your vote can really count. In school board elections, often school board elections are like 15% people of people voting or under. As we think about schools reopening or not and how they're doing that and what they're doing about school buses and, you know, uh, hot spots and so forth, like who gets elected to school board really, really matters for our lives. That's number one. Number two, I misspoke if I, when I suggested that no matter what you do, right, you won't count, or, right? That, that's not what I meant to say. Um, and this really does pick up on uh, Sean's point about organizing. It's that um, you are stronger together than you are alone. Right. So even as we look, so the fact that I was saying like two thirds of young citizens, uh, you know, under the age of 30 did not vote. In fact, if we bumped that number up just by three or four percent, that in itself would be enough to change a number of not only local, but statewide and national races. So, um, so that's important to remember is that uh, if we can shift patterns some, then that can have a huge cascade of effects. And then also using your voice is huge, right? Like, um, you know, one individual uh, who has found a position of power and can use their voice and be heard by millions um, can, can make an enormous difference. So I think we should probably move to the to the chat box because we do have a question in the chat box and we only have about five or six minutes left. So um, there's a question from Jay Philbrick. What do you think is the most effective platform for reaching out to, uh, to underserved communities for voter registration and civic engagement? Is it in person, over the phone, text, social media? What could each of us commit to to really overcome this engagement gap? So there are two parts to this wonderful question. Mary, you want to start? Or you want to jump in? 
Uh, you're the you're the only a grand organizer. Go for it. <laughs> um, what I will say is, I, I think this is what we call in the organizing world relational organizing, right? I think that that is going to be the biggest asset to us right now, especially in this COVID environment. Again, it was it's one of those things that when you were doing voter registration, you can go stand out on a corner at some point in time and harass people on their way to lunch or wherever, um, you know, and try to build up those numbers and what we name as hot spots. But I think that now because of the number of limited because the amount of limited interaction that we have, of course, that approach is a lot different now. Uh, again, we were talking about it from a perspective of even just knocking on someone's door. The likelihood of them answering the door right now in a COVID environment for someone they don't know is slim to none on average, unless it's an Amazon box or something that they've ordered last week, right? Uh, but I do think that on the flip side of it, one, uh, using relational organizing, and that is dealing with the people that you know. So oftentimes, one of those things that you'll have friends who you know, like you two who are one about to graduate high school and two going into her senior year, you'll have friends who say, oh, yeah, I'm registered to vote. Uh-huh, I am for certain. And then all of a sudden, they're really not re registered to vote, but they're telling you that because that seems to be what's the common trend going around. And you have to keep that relational pressure there, right? At the end of the day, it's not, oh, are you registered to vote? Great, you're registered to vote. Then come out and do this with me. Or, oh, I'm going to vote on this day, um, you know, would you like to go with me? Or my mail-in ballot came, did you actually get your mail-in ballot? Have you sent it back yet? That individual relationship accountability is gonna be very crucial right now. Um, I look at it something as simple as even we're in a, a slightly more privileged situation. I have a degree in political science. Um, and like I said, first generation college grad on both sides. So when the election comes around, my parents and aunts and uncles and easily come and go, hey, this ballot came or this what the ballot looks like, uh, who should I vote for? Right, And it's encouraging and having those conversations with each other that we have to do because just because I work in this environment and I actually want to vote for a certain candidate doesn't necessarily mean that this is the candidate for you. Um, so it's having those conversations, having those topics being discussed, um, not just within your home, but even outside your home with your friends, some of your colleagues, um, and those types of interactions that can go a, a long way to helping us improve and increase not just our voter registration, but also turnout on the back end. Yeah. Mira, you, do you want to speak to this one? I think Sean nailed it. I think the only other thing I would add um, in asking, like the, the question included, uh, like what can we personally commit to? Yeah, that's how I, I wanted to add that. You know, if you have this video in about two minutes, if you can yeah, speak yeah, yeah. to that and if you have a takeaway that you want people to have from, from this. Yeah, so I think the takeaway is to normalize the fact that you care about voting Mm -hmm. and make it um, and make it that much more inviting for the people you care about to care about voting. Uh, so the personal invitations are huge. Also, the posting things on Insta, the, you know, you send a snap, you know, having a snap of a, of a ballot near you or like even like they're just, you know, making funny TikToks, but about like it, these things. They, they matter because they normalize the fact that um, uh, that being civically and politically engaged is just part of life for everyone. Good, thank you. Sean, a, a key takeaway or thought about this question, what can, what can each of us commit to? Voting and getting involved in any way that you see fit at whatever level you see fit. Uh, we all have to start somewhere. So just number one, vote, and then two, find a way to get involved in something that matters to you. Beautiful. And make sure you're registered to vote by yes, the deadline. Yes, please. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know your voter registration laws and how to vote. Absolutely. Um, yeah. All right. Let me, um, a, a huge thanks, a big heartfelt thanks to Sean and to Mira and to Tarun and Hannah Neal. I'm sorry we didn't have much more time um, to all our participants. And I did want to say, um, just announce our next session, which will be Tuesday at five o'clock, and we'll be hearing from Michael F Firestone um, about voting in the time of co voter registration and voting in the time of COVID. We'll also be hearing from Kia Sims, who works for Fair Fight, which is Stacey Abrams' organization, and Martha Minow, who uh, is at Harvard Law School. Um, and and uh, we'll have some folks from our Youth Advisory Board back as well. Um, so thank you again for everybody. Big shout out, big 
big applause for you. Thanks so much. Um, be well and take care, everyone. And I will hope to see you on Tuesday. Bye-bye. Thank you all. Thanks for the invitation and for the great conversation.